Well, good afternoon, everyone. Jora, buenas tardes, boa tarde. Oh, I don't see any Brazilians here, but lovely to see you all today. Um, we should be joined by one or two more people, um, so we'll just ask them to filter in quietly if, if and as they come. Um, but for those, I think I know most people in the room, but I don't know everyone in the room. Uh, I'd like to start by welcoming you all here. We had some distinguished guests. We have three ambassadors with us today in, in alphabetical order, so I don't cause any offence. <laughs> and then we'll go reverse alphabetical order. We'll, get, we'll start with the ambassador of Peru. Thank you for joining us. The ambassador of Chile and the ambassador of Argentina. Um, all good friends of our Cape. Um, we've got some special guests beside me and on the screen here today. Um, uh, on the screen, we have um, the Honourable Tim Grosser, former Trade Minister for New Zealand and Ambassador to the United States, and before that, Ambassador to the WTO. Uh, we have John Ballingall, who co-authored a report, which I know you've all read, every single one of you, um, last year on New Zealand and Latin America trade opportunities, um, looking at the barriers and the, um, the instruments to which New Zealand's trade with Latin America can become closer. And we have our special guest here too, um, Dr. Deborah Elms, founder and executive director of the Asian Trade Center in Singapore. So thank you for joining you. us, Deborah. Um, just to explain the format for today, and but before I do that, I'll give you a little indication of why we're here. Um, or why we've invited you. You know why you're here, but we know why we've invited you. Um, also, like to thank, introduce the honorary consul for uh, Colombia, Peter Cullen, and, and so um, and other distinguished guests and friends of, of our centres. Um, I'm the director of the Latin America Cape, and that means the Latin America Centre of Asia Pacific Excellence. And for those of you who don't know the Capes, there are three of us. Um, one based on North Asia, one based on Southeast Asia, and one based on Latin America. Uh, the North Asia one's up at Auckland, the other two are down here at Victoria, but we're all backed by four New Zealand universities, Waikato and Otago being the other two. And we were created about five and a half years ago now um, to be basically hubs of intercultural expertise to prepare New Zealanders to succeed in the Asia Pacific in their chosen field. Now, the Asia-Pacific, obviously, was defined to include Latin America. Um, what's the unique thing about the Capes? Well, we were created to transfer academic knowledge from the universities to civil society. And we do so through a range of innovative events, programs, and resources. But we like bringing people together. Um, we like bringing uh, academics, and we will see a brief clip of an academic from Chile with us today, um, with government people and with business people and just members of civil society. And today, too, there might be one or two of you are here, members of civil society who are affiliated with our partners for this event, the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs. So all three of the capes are about capacity building. To, so New Zealanders can develop their relationships with um, the three regions, commercial relationships, educational relationships, and cultural relationships. But in the case of the Latin America Cape, we, we have defined that sometimes we have this extra responsibility as well, and that's to put Latin America on more New Zealanders' radars because there are some New Zealanders who engage with Latin America quite deeply, but not as many as there could be. There are some New Zealanders who don't think about opportunities in Latin America in ways they could. And there are all sorts of reasons for that, but sometimes it's simply a lack of awareness. So we do events like this, which try and raise the profile of Latin America um, among um, our, our um, patriots. So, Ways we, it's not just events, we've also done some rather unique videos. Later in the year, we will be producing a data visualization tool to map all the relationships between New Zealand and Latin America. Um, and at the end of this particular hour, we'll be um, doing a little promotion of a business course we offer to those of you who want to do. Um, uh, learn more about export opportunities in Latin America 
a welcome. We'll, we'll just present that to you briefly. But this is what we call today one of our thought leadership events, by which I mean it's an event where we raise issues, where we put New Zealand and Latin America together in ways they may not be known by many people. Maybe be known by the specialists, but not beyond. So trade agreements and trade policy are related areas which really fit into this category. There's a lot more which unites New Zealand and Latin America than is commonly known um, in, in society. The presence of Latin America in New Zealand trade agreements, uh, in, in trade agreements that New Zealand has, it, it is um, disproportionately very, is proportionately very large. In the CPTPP, for example, there are three members, three member nations, and three who would like to be members. And considering there are only 11 members, that's quite a high proportion. And so while agreements like the CPTPP are really important for New Zealand, they're also important for some Latin American nations. And there are other agreements too, which we'll hear about. So we've, we've gathered, we've basically organized this event to promote that fact and then to delve into what it actually means. What does it mean? What do trade agreements really mean for New Zealand and Latin America? And how do they unite New Zealand and Latin American nations? So I'm a historian, um, not a business person by discipline. So I always love starting with history. And someone who was really at sort of the, some of the founding of the New Zealand Latin American dialogue on, um, on trade agreements and trade policy was our first speaker, the Honorable Tim Grosser. So, um, Tim, over to you to give us some sort of personal background of a couple of moments of um, how New, Ze New Zealand and Latin America even began talking about trade. So, if I may pass, pass, the, um, pass the microphone to you. Well, kia ora, and thank you very much, Matthew, for this opportunity to speak to you and some old friends of mine. Um, I think I said to you in an email that my characterization of the past can please both the Marxists and the neoliberals because the Marxist side of the analysis is we have an objective shared economic interest with Latin America um, of enormous importance to all of our countries, and that was to promote greater liberalization of trade and agriculture given the structure of our economies. The personal side of it is that the personal relationships developed originally in Geneva through the multilateral process between Australasian and Latino uh, negotiators um, have proved to be enormously important in further developments. So I, I arrived in Geneva in 1985 uh, as New Zealand's chief agriculture negotiator, later became chief negotiator overall. And that was the high point of this coalition between basically Australia and New Zealand on the one side of the equation and Latin America on the other with Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay and others in the Cairns group. So our objective shared interest in getting operationally effective rules over the most important export sectors to our economies forged this strategic alliance at the multilateral level. And it was actually astonishingly successful. Uh, I, and we're not going to convert this uh, discussion into a, dis into a discussion per se about the multilateral system. Uh, and, and those links that we develop with Latin American trade negotiators and the political process around them, then carried forward into the next phase, which was um, TPP. So what had happened was um, I was... Um, I then finished an assignment as ambassador to Indonesia and was principal economic advisor to MFAT and wrote a discussion paper for the Singaporeans, which basically said, I'm very worried that the WTO is losing momentum and we will not launch the Seattle round at the end of this year in 1999. That proved to be correct. So why don't we, New Zealand and Singapore, start to operationalize an idea to actually make realistic the Bogle goals. Because the Bogle goals in the APIC context, you will remember Matthew and friends, were a, a commitment to get free trade for developed economies by 2010 and developing uh, economies by 2020. And while I and my colleagues supported the objective, um, many of us, certainly including me, thought 
the process was dreaming in technicolor, that there was no way the United States and Japan would liberalize a single HS tariff line because of a political statement made outside Jakarta in 1994. And so it turned out to be the case. So we thought we have to do what the past leaders of trade negotiations have done, and that's marshal the power of reciprocity, something that you know many purist economists uh, don't like, and I understand why they don't like it, but that's the way forward. So we thought we're going to try and drive Pacific integration across the three key areas, North America, Latin America, Asia, sorry, four, and Australasia via a plurilateral FTA. So I wrote this think piece for Singapore. To my surprise, the Singaporeans said, yes, we negotiated this. And then I wanted to move to the next stage of involving Latin America. So I had a very interesting discussion with uh, two of my closest Latin friends, uh, Alejandro Jara, who later became not only Chile's ambassador to the WTO, but deputy director general of the WTO, and Ricardo Lagos Jr., who was, um, apart from being the son of the president, was actually the head of the Chilean trade policy system. And they said, well, we'll need to speak to Ricardo's father, but in principle, yes. And then this bilateral agreement uh, that we had started with Singapore moved on to the next phase of involving Latin America. And then at the end, it became P4 because tiny Brunei wanted to join it. And as you know, the history after that, um, in 2010, finally, the Obama administration, I've been minister for trade for two years up to that point, but finally at the APEC leaders meeting in 2010, Mike Froman drafted for the president's approval the short press statement saying the US would join and then hell broke out. Um, Australia then came in because uh, they've been very reluctant for historical reasons. I've not time to explain it here. Australia came in, Malaysia came in, and then the other huge step forward when Mexico, Japan, and Canada came into it, making it the biggest show in trade town. Well, you know what then happened. Trade, the political base in the United States started to evaporate further. Um, it's still going backwards, in my view. We can discuss this in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, the Americans dropped out. Um, we carried on after, I mean, I had been sent up to be ambassador, to resigned as trade minister because we, John Key and I, uh, both, along with 99% uh, of American political commentators, I'd have to say in my defense, assumed Hillary would win the election and we could find a way to re-engineer American leadership of the initiative. But um, it was not to be. And uh, to my uh, frankly surprise, Japan showed, for, I would say for the first time, since 1945, a capacity to move ahead without the United States and provided the grunt as the third largest economy in the world to carry it forward. Now, in the middle of all this came this bifurcation of Latin America on trade policy between Mercosur and the Alianza del Pacifico, Pacific Alliance. And I've been close because of my Latin connections to uh, a number of the Latins involved in that. So you had this 1950s style customs union, and then this new outward looking F plurilateral FTA of the Pacific Alliance between Chile, Colombia, Mexico, led by Mexico in terms of power, economic power, and um, who have I left off? Peru. So the four outward looking Latin economies established this in remarkable time. Uh, on the basis of the same type of open trading philosophy that Australia and New Zealand uh, have had for a number of years. So I, I, I wrote uh, to Ildefonso Guajardo, the um, then Mexican minister, another think piece, asking if New Zealand could be the first uh, non-Latino um, associate member of the alliance. It, it, it went quite well, but the fundamental problem was um, Colombia. Not because Colombia was a protectionist country. It was, I mean, after all, the president, President Santos, had been Minister of Trade and is basically a free trader. Uh, but he was in the final stages, for those of you involved in the political side of our relationship with Latin America, will recall that he was managing this extraordinary process of trying to reach a settlement with FARC 
the um well, i won't try and use adjectives to describe what it is because that in itself is a political choice you could call them terrorists if you like or you could find some other term and to establish peace in colombia and because they were centered in rural colombia any liberalization with new zealand given new zealand's uh, real power in agriculture was going to be an added problem for his far more important agenda. And John Key and I, when we went through Colombia, could hardly do anything but agree with him. So, you know, the, so those are the three strands, uh, Matthew. Um, they're all related in a way. They're all about our Latin and um, Australasian economies trying to find a politically operational path to defend our economic interests, primarily in the field of agriculture, the personal links that grew from them. But isn't, I'd like to just pick up a sentence, I can't recall your exact words, but the sentiment of some introductory comments you've made is very important. People who are not steeped in trade policy perhaps don't understand how powerful trade policy is in broader foreign relations, foreign ministry, foreign policy terms in establishing links. You know, as somebody spent decades in a foreign ministry, you can have elite discussions between senior diplomats on things going on in the UN or the ILO and so forth. But frankly, what really interests our people for the most part is economic opportunity, making a living if you want to be brutal about it. So what I think trade policy is complementary to foreign policy, but it establishes, a, if I go back to a Marxist type analysis, establishes a material base for a relationship that would otherwise be largely foreign ministry to foreign ministry and therefore useful but limited in its penetration. Happy to take this conversation in whatever direction you want to go, Matthew. Thank you very much, Tim. Really appreciate those opening remarks and I, I'm sure there will be some questions afterwards. Um, so Tim has agreed, he's, he's actually coming to us from Auckland, so he'll be staying around for, for the question and answer session. Um, but we, we now would, before before we invite you, we've got to, to ask questions of him. We've got a couple of other speakers. And John, as John knows, we asked him to speak tonight because he did the study last year um, for his consultancy, Sense Partners, of the broader Latin American relationship. And one of the key things, he, he one of the key points he made was that trade agreements were significant to the potential development of the New Zealand Latin American relationship, uh, the, the trade relationship. Um, so do you want to begin by amplifying on that general comment, John, what were some of the main uh, points that you made in your report uh, in relation to free trade agreements? And, and secondly to that, have you seen any effect already of free trade agreements on New Zealand Latin American trade? Sure, Thank, thanks, Matthew. And, um... Thank you, Tim, for your, your uh, historical overview. It's always fascinating. Um, our report uh, focused more broadly on the economic relationship between uh, New Zealand and, and Latin America. So it wasn't just about trade policy. Um, and so the, the key findings were really that there is huge untapped potential in, in Latin America um, for, for New Zealand exporters. And in a world where diversification is... is uh, uh, becoming ever more important, perhaps. Um, Latin America definitely warrants a, a second look. Um, in terms of particular opportunities and where trade agreements might come in, we, we know that CPTPP has been very uh, beneficial, especially for trade with, with Mexico. Um, that's been growing very strongly indeed, uh, above, above uh, the trend growth before the FTA came into place. Um, it was interesting to hear Tim talking about our shared interest in, in agriculture and, and primary products. And I, I think that's true, um, particularly when we're working together, dealing with external third parties and trying to persuade them to reduce their trade barriers on, on these things. Um, but what we did find was that uh, broadly across Latin America, um, the highest trade barriers tend to be in things that New Zealand's quite big, uh, quite good at producing. So I, I think we need to be a little cautious in, in uh, focusing too much solely on our traditional uh, pastoral exports, um, because that's where the highest trade barriers are, and we don't necessarily want to try and compete 
with uh, Latin American producers. Um, we found that there might be more benefits in trying to find a, a, a niche related to agriculture and food production. Um, things like um, supporting Latin American supply chains um, through packing equipment, through logistics, uh, through agritech, things that uh, boost our exports, but also support Latin American countries to boost their exports too. And we're not directly competing. Um, more broadly beyond that, I think uh, our, our perspective was that there, there is untapped potential, but uh, firms need to be realistic. It needs to be a long-term investment. Um, we need to have ideally local connections on the ground. Again, uh, Tim talked about the importance of relationships. Uh, and I think that's hugely important in Latin America. That requires investment and it requires this long-term perspective. Um, but overall, I think uh, Latin America represents a, a very valuable opportunity for New Zealand, provided businesses approach it with the, um, the right mindset, not trying to get a quick win, investing for the long haul, and being prepared to uh, work through some of the ups and downs uh, of, of the region. Now, John, we launched that report middle of last year, midwinter last year, effectively. Mm. Um, when, when you um, were, were preparing it, was there anything about the relationship between New Zealand and Latin America which surprised you? <coughs> um, <coughs> I, th I think some of the diversity of our exports in, in, in certain niches is very impressive. It's If you look at it at a high level, our trade is largely about dairy and people in terms of education in particular. But if you look a bit further beyond that, you start to see these niches emerging around agritech, uh, around high-tech medical exports, uh, such as Fisher and Paykel's sleep apnea machines, things you wouldn't necessarily expect. Uh, but again, we're not directly competing with Latin American producers. Um, we're supporting well-being more broadly uh, in, in Latin American economies. Um, so I, I think the, the biggest surprise um, was perhaps that we're not doing more. And, and that's why it's really great that we've got institutions such as yourselves to try and lift awareness, um, encourage these long-term investments. Well, thank you, thank you, John. One of the things that we're trying always to do is that, of course, if we, we are a Latin American center, we're champions for the region. And so, of course, we will be saying positively about it. So it's the reason why we, why we, we asked um, your consultancy to do the report um, together with MFAT was to have an objective lens on it. Mm. And, and we'll shortly go to the reason what we invited Deborah here, namely that we wanted someone who was, was not committed neither to New Zealand nor to Latin America um, to give a view of, of trade policy and where the trade agreement relationship stands. But before we ask her to speak, we're just going to play a little snippet of a video uh, from one of our closest Chilean um, collaborators, uh, Jorge Saad, who's from the Catholic University of Chile. Hello, everyone. My name is Jorge Saad. I'm the director of the Center for International Studies of the Catholic University of Chile, and I'm delighted to participate in this interesting conference about Latin America and regional trade, a view from Asia on current opportunities and development. From the Latin American side, there are some opportunities to advance or to progress in this goal to create or to keep developing the ties between New Zealand and Latin America. Let me start with two countries. Chile, after a long political debate and some controversy, last week approved and ratified the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think that it was a good decision in the line to deepen the relations in the Trans-Pacific area. And secondly, another country, Uruguay. Uruguay is promoting a more, an op a more open approach to trade policy and it's starting to uh, looking for different areas and countries in the other side of the world to create or to start negotiating free trade agreements. Move now to the Latin America. Latin America is looking from, for the Pacific, is seeking 
this area of Asia Pacific. First, the Pacific Alliance is, has been the most successful integration initiative in Latin America over from more than one decade. New Zealand is an associate state of that block and we expect that New Zealand can conclude uh, its negotiation with the Pacific Alliance like Singapore last year. The CPTPP, secondly, as I mentioned, this is the most ambitious FTA in the Asia Pacific, which means a better access to markets, higher labor and environment standards, more modern rules, and the incentive for being part of new global value change in a context of the near shoring or reshoring of the different uh, value chains that already has been so dependent to China. So that's just a little bit of a tease about what the whole video is going to be. We're going to play the whole video to an Auckland event we're going to do up in Auckland. But just to for the interactivity, we didn't want to show so everything now, but we, we, we're happy to share the video with you later. Um, so we've we've got, we've had some context already. We've had um, the minister offering a historical view. We've had an impersonal historical view. We've we've had uh, John speaking about some of the main findings of his report. And what he's just giving a little little taster of, of what um, current Latin American developments are on the trade front. But it's now my great pleasure to uh, invite um, Dr. Deborah Elms to make some remarks. Um, for those in the trade policy area, she's she's highly regarded. Um, she has she runs her own blog, and we became aware of of, of Deborah. I must admit, through the Auckland, the founders of the Auckland Trade and Economic Policy School where she was speaking last week. Um, and that was talking about trade um, to a, a group audience, many of whom were New Zealand's future diplomats, but media commentators as well. And so what we asked Deborah to talk about was sort of talk, give us a, just as John gave us, if you like, a neutral view or from an economic point of view, this is more um, a neutral view from a geographical view, but also expertise. What are the current opportunities Latin American nations have to shape, have to shape the current rules and flows of trans-Pacific trade? So take that question as you wish okay. and, and, and extend upon it, and then we can get into some inter interactivity. Excellent. Um, thank you all very much. Um, thanks for having me here, this lovely room, frankly. I, I'm sad you can't see the view, but it's quite stunning. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's important to remember sort of what are we trying to accomplish when you do a trade agreement? And I would say there are a number of things, one of which um, Ambassador Grosser was discussing, which is having that, that hook or that avenue uh, using trade agreements in particular as a way to continue a dialogue, a discussion, et cetera. I think that's important, but I'm not gonna talk about that for the moment. So, so remember that that exists, put it to the side. The other reason why you do trade agreements, at least this is my view, is because you want to lower the risks and increase the certainty for companies. In my view, and I realize this is slightly old fashioned, but nonetheless, I think it's important. A trade agreement is supposed to be about improving the conditions for business between the parties. So you are trying to create less risk and greater certainty for companies who are doing business between the connected parties. And I think that's super important for, especially for economies, most of which is, I guess, most of the world, that are built on small businesses. You know, small businesses are the backbone of every economy, and that's certainly true here in New Zealand. And what you want to do, in my view, in a good trade agreement, is you want to make it easier for small businesses to do business across borders. It would be great if we had more progress in the global system to do this because it's a whole lot easier for a small business to manage one set of rules than multiple. But failing that, next best alternative is to have larger regional groupings. And in that context, I would say CPTPP is super important because it allows the lowering of those risks and the increase of the certainty of market conditions in the member economies. And so we now have 
um, as the video just mentioned, happily Chile just signed on and Peru is a relatively recent member and Malaysia as well. So we have moved the CPTPP from its original P4 foundations through to nearly everyone who is a current member actually being an active current member and accessions underway. So I think that the CPTPP is crucially important, particularly in my view, for links between Asia and Latin America, again, three of the members in CPTPP, uh, Chile, Peru, and Mexico, uh, ha have those relationships built underneath the CPTPP rules. It's almost 600 pages of rules. It's thousands of pages of schedules. We are multiple years now into this process. And so tariffs are at or near zero on an awful lot of products, services, and investment are, is opened. Um, there are all sorts of other rules contained within the CPTPP, and I think it's much easier for businesses, including small ones, to use this agreement to trade. Now, many people will disagree with this because they will say, well, the CPTPP is super complicated, right? It's all that stuff. How can a small business figure it out? But here's the thing with CPTPP. When you have zero tariffs, you have zero tariffs, right? That's actually quite simple for a small business. Zero is zero. That's fantastic. And yes, it's a bit complicated and they have to follow certain rules, um, but even those rules for a small business is actually easier than you think because a small business doesn't have 150,000 SKUs that they have to keep track of. A small business has like three products. And so once they unravel the rules of CPTPP for three things, they can then export that into all of the markets that are currently a member and then those markets that will be members in the future without any changes. That is super important if you're small and you're making something like, I don't know, apple juice or a microphone or something. You know, I don't know what small businesses make here necessarily, but especially in the space in trading goods. If you have the the if you've met the rules for CPTPP and making your apple juice or apple jam or tarts or frozen pies or whatever it is you're making, and you want to export that, you don't have to worry about switching out the materials, the raw materials, the parts and components when you ship them somewhere else. That is so helpful for companies and especially for small companies who I think can benefit significantly from an agreement like the CPTPP. And as I mentioned, it's not just the current three members, but our lineup now for accession into the agreement is increasingly Latin American. So we, right now, literally this week is another round of UK accession. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we get the UK over the line very soon. And then we have to turn our attention to a long list and growing list of applicant countries, uh, China, Taiwan, but also a bunch of Latin American countries, including some new, new candidates like Costa Rica, which I think is another interesting and promising avenue for New Zealand-based companies. To think about how might they be able to access this market where there have historically been not as many links, there's no existing agreement, they're not part of APEC, sort of new, to find new market opportunities. And then the last thing that I would just say in the context of small businesses and these trade deals with Latin America, you know, I think it's probably easier for New Zealand-based small businesses to access some of the Latin American markets, because, especially the Latin American CPTPP markets, because the competition is not quite the same as it is, say, in across Asia where it can be very hard for small New Zealand-based firms to compete in some of these highly competitive markets. You have different opportunities, I think, in many of the Latin American markets. And I think that provides an opportunity for small businesses here to find new market niches that they otherwise wouldn't have available to them. So I think that that's very, very useful. Um, and it's why, again, it's why do we do these trade agreements in the first place? not just to keep diplomats busy, but actually to give some kind of real world benefits. And TPP certainly does that. And then the last one that I'll just note because it hasn't been, hasn't been flagged, but I think it can be useful. In my lowering the risk and increasing the certainty category, I would also point to DEPA, the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement that also connects uh, New Zealand and Chile uh, with Singapore for DEPA, which is also expanding. And, those digital rules and the modules contained within there is also about trying to create a better consistent set of rules for digital trade between these markets. Uh, and DEPA is also undergoing some accession as well, and not quite the same list. It's not yet, we're not quite as large, but the ideas are the same. You know, you start small and then you build up from there and you work with like-minded players in order to create 
consistent rules for the future. So I think I would just highlight that there's also this effort to promote other kinds of engagement like DEPA between New Zealand and Latin America. And I think that that's to be welcomed and encouraged. Thanks. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, the, uh, those, both those deals, of course, have also the strong Asian components as well. So the, the, the Singapore one. Uh, how about a couple of the other ones, which are more specific to like, there's a gender agreement, there's a climate change mm. agreement. Um, they probably don't get as much attention beyond foreign ministries. Uh, any comments about about either the um, the Inclusive Trade Action Group or the ACCTS? I'm not in the foreign ministry, so I don't have to learn all these acronyms, but the climate change agreement. Well, I mean, I, again, I, I would say following on the footsteps of, especially uh, as Ambassador Grosser mentioned, the, the evolution from bilateral to three party to four party to seven to nine to 11 to 12 to 11 to who knows what, you know, that shows you that there is a way for you to start relative.